Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. Before we get started, I'd like to do some brief, a brief overview of your Zoom controls. If you're joining us from a laptop or desktop, you'll see your control panel in the bottom of the screen. If you're joining us from a tablet, the control panel will be on the top right of the screen. Later in this meeting, we will ask questions of the panelists. The moderator will first ask questions submitted in advance. If there is any time remaining, questions will be taken in the Q&A panel. At that time, you can navigate to the Q&A button, select it to open the Q&A panel and type your question in. The moderator will then read your question to the candidates in the room. Thank you for your participation. Stepping up to serve the community is something we should thank all the candidates for doing. The town of Kiowa has a critically important role in our community, and we at Kika truly value the partnership that we enjoy with them. The strength of that partnership and the great working relationship has been on display numerous times in the last few years as we've navigated storms together begun the important work of developing an adaptive management strategy for sea level rise, and of course the challenges we've faced as the result of COVID-19. I particularly want to acknowledge outgoing Mayor Craig Weaver, who has put in an extraordinary amount of time and effort during his term on council and his two terms as mayor. Our new mayor will have a tough act to follow. At this point, I'd like to explain tonight's format. While my role tonight is to be a moderator, I don't expect that my task will be at all similar to that of Chris Wallace or Kristen Welker during the recent presidential debates. We don't have microphones to mute, and I don't expect that our candidates will try to talk over one another. We simply want to have a conversation about their views on the important issues facing Kiowa. I'll ask each candidate to make a two minute opening statement. Then we'll go through questions submitted to Kika in advance. We've shared with the candidates the overarching topics, but not the questions themselves. We'll rotate the order in which, question, order in which questions are answered and each candidate will have up to two minutes to answer. If we get through all of the pre-submitted questions and have time remaining, as Emily mentioned, we'll take questions from those participating online. And then at the end, each candidate will have two minutes to make a closing statement. Because of COVID protocols, as well as space and technology limitations, we're splitting tonight into two sessions. The council candidates are going first, and after an hour, we'll take a brief break to straighten things up, to, to clean whatever we need to clean, and then we'll have the mayoral candidates for the second hour. We'll also ask that everyone wear a mask except for when they are speaking. So at this time, I'm gonna go over to my seat uh, and ask the council candidates to stand as I call up their names. One of the accomplishments of um, the current mayor and council is the establishment of staggered terms for town council. In order to make that happen this year, there are uh, 
folks running for a four-year term and folks running for a two-year term. Running for a four-year term in which there are two seats available, we have two candidates. The first candidate is John Moffitt and the other candidate is Scott Parker. We have two seats available for the two-year term with three candidates running. They are Mary Ann Connolly, Dan Prickett, and John Ross. At this point, we will just go in order and we will, at, we will start at my left and ask John Moffat to come make his two minute opening statement. So uh, I'm John Moffat and uh, I've been coming to Kiowa for um, almost 35 years. Uh, my wife and I celebrate our third wedding anniversary year and, uh, and next year we'll be 40. So we stayed at the old inn and um, it became our go-to place over the years. As we had kids, it just seemed to be the ideal spot to come. They offered everything we wanted. Uh, so as I had said in my bio, if you've read that, uh, in 94, we bought a lot. We built a house in 2000. We used it for weekends and vacation. We had moved to Charlotte, so it was very convenient. Um, I retired four years ago and uh, moved here full time. Um, uh, much to my wife's chagrin, she didn't retire until just a year before last, and so she moved down here then. Uh, but we've been full-time since uh, the, the spring of 2019. And so as a result of being here all those years, we followed very closely kind of what's happened with the town from the old days of the Jeep safaris at the, at the eastern end of the island to now where the, the, the last of the lots have been platted um, on the eastern end of the island. So... I guess from the, from the perspective of the, the town and the Kika organization and the resort and the developer, and we've watched a lot of things change over the years. And through those years, particularly as my children became um, adults, they, uh, they encouraged me to get involved in something here. And they said their feeling was, and I think I share that now, um, that if I'm gonna live here, I should be actively involved in something that helps guide the way this island develops. So um, I decided a couple of years ago that I might run for town council. Um, so I went and spent some time talking with Mayor Weaver um, and we decided that a, a, a better first step uh, might be to join the planning commission, uh, which I did when Dan Prickett ran for council two years ago and I finished out his term. And then I was appointed to uh, a, a term of my own uh, last January. So that's what, what I've been doing the last two years. And when this opportunity came up to run for council this time, particularly with the four year and two year choices, um, I thought maybe the time was right to go ahead and take a, take a little bit bigger step. And so that's, uh, we just, my wife and I talked about it a lot and I decided that this was the way to go. Um, and I think part of the reason that I'm doing it is that um, I do wanna be involved in what happens here. I wanna have some input on what develops in this island. Uh, we've got some huge issues in front of us not bad things necessarily, but things that need to be addressed as we move forward. Uh, whether it's what happens to the island as the developer finishes his work, um, you know, this the, the adaptive uh, programs that we've got, particularly with the sea level rise and uh, protecting the marsh and worrying about what may happen to our fresh water aquifer. Those are huge issues that are gonna have long-term impacts on the island. And I would like to be involved in, in some kind of resolution to those issues. Um, I think that as the population of Kiowa grows um, and ages, um, I'm at two or had two? I, that's all two? That's two. So, okay, my two minutes is up. So um, I do think it's a unique place and uh, I appreciate your, your support. Thank you. Next up is Scott Parker. <clears throat> Give me the hook about 30 seconds before we, um, I'm done. Uh, I'm Scott Parker and I'm a retired physician. Specifically, I'm a pathologist. Now, the word pathologist and the phrase polished public speaker are rarely, if ever, spoken in the same sentence. And you are going to have ample evidence of that tonight when I talk. Uh, we have been here on Kiowa now for 17 years and have been full-time residents for the last seven. When we moved here, I, I was fully retired and I have a lifetime of service to others. And so I made a dedication that I was going to serve my new community as, as best I could. 
As part and parcel of that, I have tutored mathematics at Ryerson Elementary and over at Hot Gap. I have done uh, philanthropic work with Barrier Island Street Medical Clinic for the last five years, uh, chairing their largest fundraising organ uh, event, uh, and we've been wildly successful at that. I am, am an avid golfer, a former uh, commissioner of the Friday Walkers, which is the largest and longest uh, men, continuous men's golf association. I'm an avid duplicate bridge player where I've been on the board of directors for the Charleston Bridge Center for the last three years and have been a president for the last two years. Uh, and, and for town service, I've been a member of the Public Safety Commission Committee and I'm, I'm currently serving on the Board of Zoning Appeals. Uh, I was approached by a current uh, town council member. I talked to him for about an hour. I met with the mayor for about an hour, thought about it for a while, and made the decision that this was the right way for me to go to continue in my, my journey to help, help my little community do what's best. What I bring to the table is no agenda uh, and um, a diverse set of things from a new set of eyes. I believe that the town and the various K's all need to work together, and I believe that they've done that, and I look forward to having that opportunity to do it again. Thank you. Thank you very much. And those are our two candidates for the four-year terms. First up for the two-year term is Marianne Connolly. <laughs> Thank you, Jimmy. I'm Mary Ann Conley, and I thank the Kiowa Island Community Association for sponsoring this candidate forum and giving each of us the opportunity to present our views and experience. I'm completing my first term as an active member of the town council. It's been a rewarding and challenging at a time when we have begun to expect the unexpected. The sea level rise report, COVID-19, short-term rentals, and hurricanes are some examples of the challenges we have faced. The immediate needs were addressed, but there's still more to do. And I'm asking you to re-elect me so I can meet future challenges and provide continuity. My specific responsibility on the council is to head up the public safety committee which incorporates members from each of the major business entities, as well as qualified property owner representatives. Kiowa now has deputies patrolling 24 seven, and will soon have a bicycle patrol to assist during the high season. Protocols for alligator safety and shark safety have been established, and our beach patrol is equipped with EMP trained members and code enforcement officials. The CERT organization has been reorganized and has actively participated in key activities such as the triathlon. Public safety meets with the heads of the fire department, the county Sher sheriff's organization, EMS, and the beach patrol to review monthly activities and address any concerns. Moving forward, we must continue to address the wildlife and environmental issues. Working to eliminate threats to our wildlife is a priority, especially the rodenticides which have been killing our bobcats. As projects continue on Kiowa, decisions should be made in recognition of the sea level levels we report. Thank you. We won't be crazy strict, but when you hear it, start to wrap up. So next up, Dan Frickin. I, I, uh, I want to add my thanks to, Kia, uh, to Kika as well for sponsoring this tonight. I think it's important that as many people as possible get to see the candidates and hear from us. So I appreciate you doing that. Uh, I want to mention a couple of things. Um, I've had the privilege of serving for the last two years on council, and it has been a pure joy. We've had a great council. We have a wonderful staff. Um, at Kiowa, and it's amazing how these people work together in a very cooperative way to get things done for the town of Kiowa. So it's been a treat. So I am up for re-election because I have enjoyed thoroughly in my last two years. During that time, I've been responsible for several things. Uh, one is to be the council's representative to the Arts Council, which is a very important part of why we're all here, part of the enjoyment we get. I've also been the representative for the council to the planning commission and the BCA. Um, those have all been rewarding and I wanna salute the volunteers who serve on all those committees who help us um, get through the responsibilities that we're all charged with. 
Um, Nancy and I, my wife and I have lived here full time for more than 13 years, but have owned property on the island like many of you for 25 years. And we've seen the island prosper and develop and it's been really wonderful. As I focus on what's important for the second term, I focus on really three things. Number one is what I would call the off island road improvements that need to be done. As many of you know, the county is looking at the main road corridor right now, section one, section two, and section three. All of them are important to us, but section three, which is the part at this end, from Betsy Carrison on up, is probably the most important part. And there are some good options for us if we can get it connected to I-526. That's a big priority. Number two, which people have mentioned, is the environment. Most of us are here because of the environment on Kiowa, and it's at risk. Our bobcats are at the stage where they're about uh, running out of gas, and we have an unhealthy population of deer. Uh, the beaches and our marshes need help. The Conservancy is doing a great job with their studies. We need to keep that up. And finally, I want to mention the adaptive management plan. It's a barrier island. We are susceptible to rising sea levels, changing in tide patterns, and the increased weather variability. All of those become important as we move forward the next two years. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dan. And last up for opening statements is John Ross. Thank you. I'm John Ross. I'm running for a two year term and I'm new at this. By training, I'm an economist. Uh, you've got my bio, so I don't, I'm not going to go through it again. You probably know me best because I walk my dog on the beach and my dog walks me on the beach um, for a number of hours each day. So you may see me there. Uh, and you may also see me. I play very cool bridge and the uh, uh, Sandcastle is playing bridge. I will play there. You also may know me from the audit committee. I'm on the audit committee, although very few people attend the audit committee, which is actually a mistake. The audit committee is one of the best committees you can be on. It only meets twice a year, and you learn all about the organization. Um, I decided to run for this thing, this seat, because Kiwa Island is changing. Uh, you, you see it, there are people here now, they won't go home. Uh, and I guess that's good, but they are here, and it's changing. And the issue is, how is it going to change? That's what I'm interested in. And it's the people who are going to control the change are first partners. Seems to me they do very well at it. They have their agenda and they are very good at it. Then we have the resort. The resort is also quite good at their agenda. Then we have Kika. Kika represents all the members of the island. And I'm sure, and Kika has a hard job because all of the people on the island don't really agree. The smallest part of Tika are the residents, and that's us. And that's who the town is made up of. I would like for the town to have what it does. I would like for its voice and what's going to happen to the island to be big and to continue. And that's why I thought that uh, I would do this. Thank you. Thank you very much to all the candidates for their opening statements. And since John Moffat went first the last time, we'll start with Scott Parker with our first question. And this is probably the easiest one and the one that, that you expect, and y'all talk about it a little bit in your opening statements. But those are, but that is, why do you want to serve? And what do you see as the most important issues facing the community? One, I want to serve because I have a lifetime of service to others. I, uh, it's just part of my DNA to, to be driven that way. The big issues that I see that I would like to see come to the table is I would like to see one, the, the balance between nature and the human population here he is restored and is kept where it needs to be. And that is through the, that is through the coordination and a comprehensive plan that looks at how do we manage our animals? How do we manage our marshes, our maritime forests, our beaches? Uh, how do we put all that together? And then how do you make sure that a plan like that flows through every aspect of what Kika and the town control? And that's like if we have, if we're going to raise, we anticipate sea level rise, what do our building codes need to look like now to build for the future? Those are the sorts of nuts and bolts and operational details that I'm used to dealing with. And I 
what we'd like to. Uh, I also think that um, the other big thing that is for me is I would like to see that the strength of the Kiowa brand uh, continue and that the town leads the, the ventures in making sure that that brand strength stays where it is and we don't go backwards. Thank you. Mary Ann Connolly. As I mentioned, I'm already a council member and I want to continue my service to this community. I think uh, my first level of community, community service was with Brownies, onto Girl Scouts, and on and on and on. And in my previous life, when I was in New Jersey, I did serve as a mayor and as a police commissioner and ran for United States, was a candidate for United States Congress. I think it's very important to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. If we have any issues in Kiowa, if we have concerns from our property owners, we should be able to help them to resolve them in the best way possible. There's so much to do and I wanna con continue to, to contribute to the quality of life. My professional background as an AT&T human resources executive involved corporate and strategic planning. I've used those skills in my work in the community. I've also been involved, um, I have a commitment to community. I'm part of the, I'm a volunteer for Respite Care Charleston County, uh, Women Build for Habitat, and I'm a board member for Habitat for Hum Humanity, the Sea Island uh, Association. For these reasons, I wanna run and I hope you'll vote for me. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Connelly. Dan Prickett. Thank you. Um, my reason for running is actually fairly simple, and I think many of you would understand this. We are lucky enough to live in a representative democracy. Uh, that requires that citizens, normal, regular, everyday citizens, whether we're retired or not, need to step forward and serve their country. I had the chance to serve in the military and uh, I thoroughly got far more out of that service than I ever put into it. And I say that honestly, and I feel the same way about public service. Yes, there's some time that goes into it. Uh, there's some time that maybe has to take away from golf and tennis and all the other things we love to do on Kiowa, but it's worth it. I get 10 times that back in the reward of serving the public. So that's why I do it. Um, I mentioned to you my three priorities. If I am lucky enough to be reelected for a second term, I'll mention them again. The off-road, off-island road improvements are critical to this community. Uh, we cannot survive with two rural highways that get us back and forth to the major parts of this community, Charleston and beyond. Those need to be improved, and we have a stake in, in how they're improved and what's best for us. We need to pay attention to that. Secondly, the environment. Uh, I mentioned the Kiowa Conservancy. They're working on the groundwater table. As all of you, I think, know, if we don't understand the groundwater, we will lose our maritime forest and all the vegetation, including all the golf courses. So we're paying attention to that through the Kiowa Conservancy. And they're doing a good job. That's got to continue as well as their marsh management program because the marshes and the coastline are the things, the beaches are the things that help protect the island. And thirdly, the adaptive management plan. Uh, the work that Kika is doing when you come on the island and you see all the new construction where they're helping remove the stormwater from the island without letting the island get flooded is critical. And that's part of this adaptive management plan. So. Those are my critical things going forward, and I thank you for the question. Thank you, Mr. Cricket. Mr. Ross. Um, I pretty much said if I want to run, uh, that was part of my opening statement. I mean, it, it, it is important that how the island is going to change, who determines how the island is going to change. I think this is critically important to how we go forward. That change is going to encompass lots of things. For instance, do we want more density on the island? Is this a goal we should be aiming for? Do we want more investment on the island? Is this another goal that we should be aiming for? How exactly do we want this to proceed? And how do the residents, the property owners, the resort, and the partners work together 
to make whatever we decide on happen, and how do we have the discussion? Right now, you know, I'm, at, I'm outside of most of this, but what I see are various different conversations going on. I guess, I don't know, not too much interaction, and what we need to do is make certain of those conversations are carried on together. I think the town did a great job with their own marketing study. I think that's a wonderful place to start. Everybody has a five-year plan. I don't know if they're the same, but I know the town's is about to be redone. So I think this is important. So that's why I'm working. Well, the other thing is, I think we ought to know what our competitors are doing. I thought that was a wonderful idea. So I think we ought to send out scouts and find out what Sea Island is doing, for example. How are they planning to proceed? And how do they see their place in the future? I, I think this is important. Thank you, Mr. Roth. Wrap up this question with Mr. Moffer. So the, the main reason that I want to run is that I'm a firm believer that um, that if you uh, if you if you want to participate in the process, then that gives you the right to help influence the process. If you're not going to be a participant, then you really can't sit on your couch and complain about things. And and uh, I've, I've never been of that ilk. So I want to run because I want to have some influence on what happens here over the next 20 plus years, hopefully, that I'm here. Um, I think in the short term, we've got still a, a huge issue with the coronavirus that we have to deal with. You know, how do we how do we maintain our position? How do we change that as maybe a vaccine becomes available and so forth? So that's the near term problem, I think, that, uh, that drives me in that participation. I think the environment is probably the biggest one uh, that is in front of us on how we deal with that. Uh, there are just so many aspects of that. Uh, and then the third reason is, is because of the varying constituent groups on this island. You know, we've got the town, we've got Kika, we've got property owners, we've got people that just invest to rent property, we've got the resort. Um, and, and all of those people have um, different goals and objectives that may be similar, but they're different. Um, but we have this one uh, ecosystem that is Kiowa that's unique to everywhere else there is. Um, and we need to be able to uh, accommodate the needs of all those constituent groups uh, and make them prosper in this environment. So that's why I want to run. Thank you very much. First up for the next question will be Ms. Connolly. Several of you mentioned um, in your comments um, changes on Kiowa and development and so forth. We got a couple of development issue questions. I'm gonna to try to wrap them into one for the sake of time. Um, and those are, do you feel that Kiowa is becoming overdeveloped? And if so, what might the town do about it? And what is your opinion about the options for Captain Sam's spit? Two very good questions, one important items. Um, is the island becoming overdeveloped? Surprisingly enough, the reason I got involved in my community as a elected official was because of a land issue and somebody trying to build on the property behind me, which is in a floodplain zone. As a result, I went and got involved in the town. I found out what the code was and went and talked to the uh, governing bodies about it. So development has always been an interest to me. Here in Kiowa, the reason I chose Kiowa some in 1984 is because of the master plan they had developed. I knew that there was never a chance here that we have billboards and uh, flashing lights, neon and everything else to take away from the natural, the natural environment. I feel that uh, our, our role as a council member and the mayor is to work with the developers when they have the right to develop a piece of property. There is an agreement, there's a development agreement that's been in place since the inception of Kiowa. And I believe it was in 19, uh, 2013, some amendments were made to that. Do I want more development? No, honestly, I'd be happy if there was none. However, the real, reality is, if you're a property owner, you have rights. And if you want to make exceptions to those rights, you go to the land uh, planning, to the planning commission or the zoning commission, 
and you get your exception, your exceptions. I think it's important that we make our feelings known and represent the property owners of Kiowa. But I think the most important thing is to develop that relationship so that we can come to some. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jimmy. Um, I don't think we're overdeveloped. Uh, I think where we are as a community um, is we're at the latter stages. Uh, and the latter stages of development in any community are going to be more difficult. You're down to the parcels that maybe were the last to develop because they weren't the easiest to develop. You're also developing land and so on where there is now already a surrounding community, whereas before if you were started, if we went to Ocean Park and nothing was out there, we didn't have any neighbors to worry about. Now when we develop a parcel, we have to worry about what's going on around us. So I think we're lucky that we've always had a grand plan for the island. That's made us a lot different than places like Hilton Head, for example. Um, I think we've been good about following the plan and where changes have to be made. I think there's been good negotiation among all the parties, including the community, when we do have to make some changes. Um, a good example is parcel 13, which is under current development uh, and has been in front of the planning commission. Um, and the developer there has asked for uh, some changes but it would allow if we made those changes to have uh, a higher density per building, but fewer buildings and more space around the buildings. Those are reasonable trade-offs. So I think we're doing a good job with development. I think the hard part is you're getting down now to the last stages and that's the most difficult. I think we've managed it well. I think we will continue to manage it well. I'm optimistic. What happens, you asked about, uh, you know, Captain Sam's, that's a tough question. Uh, and that's probably the most di the difficult development situation we face. It's a rare piece of land, but it has significant um, environmental impact issues, which I think have to be addressed. Um, and, and I think we're gonna do a good job with it. If all of those issues get addressed. And if they don't, then it can't be developed. Thank you. Mr. Perry. Mr. Ross. Um, Mr. Ross, um, perhaps if you would step a little closer to the center, we're hearing that it's a little bit hard to hear you. The microphone is right here. That, that, that might not be a bad thing. <laughs> So, uh, the question again. What, the question is, do you want more development? Right? right. The question is, is do you feel that Kiowa is becoming overdeveloped, and if so, what might the town do to uh, address this? And what's your opinion about the options for Captain Sam's? Captain Sam's, I'm not the one to talk about that. Uh, that's not all that I know about it. Is what I've read in the paper. The paper is clearly against the development of Captain Sam's. That's the extent of my knowledge about it. A lot of people will know about it. Um, I, I don't think we're overdeveloped. I'm not certain how much more development we can do and still be a reasonable community. Uh, and development, it, it, it gets to be sort of a trade off. You're talking about development on one side, you're talking about investment in the island on the other. Now, you need to maintain investment on the island. And yet we don't necessarily need to keep building uh, at the same sort of rate, the same kind of new construction we're building. This is why I think we need a discussion about where the island wants to go. Do we want to increase our number of units? I, I don't think so. I'm not much in favor of increasing uh, density. I think we're pretty dense as it is. However, on the other hand, I, I, we, 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 don't want to not, we don't want to not have investment in the island. And investment in the island is going to require some amount of construction, some amount of taking down the old buildings and putting up new ones. And I think we have to worry about how we trade off between those kinds of issues. That's kind of where I am. Thank you, Mr. Ross. Mr. Moffitt? 
So I, I do not think that we're overdeveloped. Um, I think we've done a really good job of balancing the notion of being a residential island that also has a resort on it. Um, and I believe that having been on the Planning Commission the last couple of years, I can echo some of what Mr. Prickett said, that when people come to modify some of these development requests, they're not just rubber stamp. There's, there's oftentimes a, a great deal of discussion and some compromise as to what the result might be. Um, I think that for us to maintain that notion that we want the island to be a residential island with a resort on it, um, kind of guides that development practice. So we don't end up with go-kart tracks and mini golf and those kinds of things. Then we would be just like many other resort communities up and down the East Coast. Um, with regard to Cap Sam Spit, um, it, um, that's, that's a, a difficult piece of property to, to really have a solid opinion about. I, as I walk by it all the time and look at how beautiful it is, I can't imagine having houses on it. Um, but if the developer has a vested right to, to develop that property uh, and we address all of the environmental issues and other concerns, then I don't think we can necessarily say, no, you can't build on it. So my preference would be no development there, um, but I'm also realistic in that at some point it probably is going to be addressed to the point where they develop it. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moffitt. Last up on this question, Mr. Parker. I agree. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> no, I, I think that the, the, the town has done a wonderful job of working with the developer. The developers have the, right, the, have the ability and the rights to develop. They've been very responsive, both in the previous uh, regime and in the current group of partners. Uh, in terms of developing the island, we have not become Hilton Head, and I think that's what we all moved here for. In terms of Captain Ham Spit, I think it's a beautiful piece of property. I would hate to see it being developed, but I'm also realistic in that I'm not going to be controlling that. That's going to be something that the Supreme Court of South Carolina is going to make up its opinion on, and we're just going to have to live with whatever, whatever comes our way with that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Parker. First up for the next question is Mr. Prickett. And this one is about COVID-19. While there have been encouraging reports in the last week about the possibility of a vaccine, it appears that if it's approved, it won't be widely available until next spring. A few days after the next council takes office, the town's current emergency orders regarding face coverings, indoor dining, Harris Teeter occupancy, and other measures expire. <laughs> what actions, if any, are you likely to recommend or support at that time? Uh, thank you. Great question. Um, we're excited about Pfizer's announcement for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is Pfizer and its German partner are among probably the best equipped companies in the world to manufacture a quality vaccine on a large scale. So it is likely if it all goes as planned, that you're right, we'll begin to see in six months, perhaps, uh, the beginnings of an outflow uh, and the chance uh, for more people to become vaccinated. However, for the population as a whole to become protected, uh, it's gonna take months after that. And I am coached on this by, uh, Nancy and I are lucky enough to have a daughter-in-law who's the head of respiratory care at Northwestern University Hospital in Chicago. She's a pulmonologist and uh, she's in the middle of COVID. She said uh, three months ago, we would be lucky if we are, have this under any kind of control with a vaccine, if we get a vaccine and now it looks like we'll have one uh, by the middle of next year. What would I do? I would ask the town at the meeting if I were elected and sworn in that we would continue the restrictions we have in place today across the board. It is a population we have here, many of whom are at risk and we cannot let up our guards. So I would continue all of the restrictions that are in place now for another 60 day period, which is all we're allowed to do by law. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Ross. Um, I agree. I mean, this is, um, the infection rate this morning was over 14 percent. That's, that's, you know, that's a whole lot of infections. I think that we should simply continue with what we're doing right this minute uh, until we get this kind of thing. Under Thank you, Mr. Ross. Mr. Moffitt? I think this is going to be a popular answer. I, 
I would continue what we've got going now. There's nothing to suggest that uh, we shouldn't do everything we possibly can to remain as safe as possible. So I would recommend that we continue the existing uh, rules uh, for 60 days. Um, we can always change that if something dramatic happens, but uh, I would vote to continue. Thank you, Mr. Moffitt. Mr. Parker? I'm gonna put my doctor hat on here. Uh, and uh, it, it makes no sense whatsoever from a public health perspective for us to go backwards, particularly at a time when the disease is surging throughout this country. And we are in a, in a position where our demographics are such that we're very, we're very much at risk. We've been very lucky because we've been isolated geographically, but at the same time, it's my understanding anecdotally that cases are now starting to pop up on the island. And for us to go backwards, it makes no sense whatsoever. We need to do everything that we can until such time as we do get vaccinated. And we have enough vaccination in the community at large, in the country at large, that, that makes it effective so that the virus transmission does not occur uh, easily. That being said, on my Bridge Center administrative hat, I told the board over six months ago that we would not even consider reopening until next September, September next year, because that's about what I thought would be the minimum length of time to get a vaccine developed, scaled up, and distributed for that population. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Fowler? In March, uh, the mayor and council declared a state of emergency here in Bam I mean, uh, Hewa. Uh, the purpose of that was to protect lives, protect the economy, and to share the burden of implementation of the safety procedures. We have the opportunity to renew that, and I believe we should. I don't think there's any excuse for not wearing the mask, for social distancing, hand washing, and being smart about being out in public. So my answer to the question is pretty simple. Yes, I agree we should renew this emergency statement. Thank you. First up for the next question is Mr. Ross. This one is on short-term rentals. The town has tightened restrictions on short-term rentals on Kiowa Island to include setting limits and stricter enforcement. Do you believe that the town has achieved the right balance or are there areas you believe need to be changed or improved? Mr. Ross, you're up first. Um, this is a good question. This is also a hard question. I'm glad that the town put restrictions on the amount of rental. I think that's, I think that's a good thing. We don't want to be uh, Hilton or I don't want to live in Hilton I guess it's a better way to say it. Uh, so we, I think we should have limits on the amount of rental. Now, whether or not the percentage is right, I think is up for discussion. I, I, don't, I don't have any idea. The other thing that I think though, is that the town and Kiko need to work better together on this short-term rental situation. In my neighborhood, one of the biggest issues right this minute is parking. And the parking is, is a problem because for those who rent, the town controls the parking spaces that they can have. For those who own, Kika controls the parking spaces they can have. So what happens is my next door neighbor can have two parking spaces, whereas I can have four or six, or it doesn't seem to matter since I don't rent. And so I, 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 I think that what we're doing as far as restrictions are correct, I think we have to work better together in terms of the enforcement and how we're going to deal with it. Thank you, Mr. Ross. Mr. Moffat. Short-term rentals. Um, have we achieved the right balance or should for the things that need to be changed or improved? So I think that we, we have a, a great starting point. I think we always have to evaluate whether our percentages are appropriate uh, as, we, as we change over time. Um, I don't think that they are uh, restrictive at this point. Um, and then with regard to the enforcement, you know, I think as long as you're going to make rules um, about how the, the short term renters uh, conduct themselves, uh, then you do need to enforce those. But again, just like the percentages, if you find that those rules need to be adjusted over time, then you do that. Uh, but I think for the time being, the short term rental process is, is very well managed. Mr. Parker? Yeah, um, 
I think that what the town has done has been very responsible in terms of capping the short-term rentals. I don't think that the 20% is an unreasonable number, especially in the R1 areas. It's my understanding that since these caps were put in place, that the, that the percentage of short-term rental applications has significantly increased or uh, bumped up against that cap. And so to John's point, we can be flexible because it seems to be working. Uh, and I think that we all want to have a community in which we recognize that there are people who have short-term rental properties, but we want to make sure that it's, it's not, doesn't overwhelm the rest of the island. At one point in our first house, we were the only house on the street that had lights on for most of the winter. Uh, and that was because we were surrounded by rental properties. And that's a different feeling than living on my current street where there are no rental properties except the one directly across from my bedroom. Uh, so I think the town's done a good job. Thank you, Mr. Parker. Ms. Connelly. Thank you. A lot of people don't know that we worked on this issue of this ordinance for a year. We did a lot of communication with the public so that people would know what's going on. When we asked our residents what they wanted, a lot of them said the problem wasn't really rentals, it was code enforcement. We went ahead and put together a code enforcement force and now we have a 24 hour hotline that's available to everybody to register complaints. You can also do it by email or there's an R, uh, online submittal form that people have access to. We're talking about single family home rentals primarily here in R1 and R2. And when I was preparing for this, I looked up the numbers of licenses that are still available at this time. It was as of October, um, I believe it's October 30th of 2020. We still had 168 licenses available for people to um, apply for. And the capped area, the percent of rentals develop, um, developed lots was 14%. So you can see from that, there's still a lot of movement that can occur and that this really hasn't uh, penalized anybody. It has actually just kept a control over a number that in the future you're trying to achieve to meet the balance between residential and rental. Thank you, Ms. Colley. Mr. Prickett. Thank you. Uh, Mary Ann is quite correct. Uh, I looked it up. And by the way, all of you can look this up on the town's website. Mm -hmm. You can find out uh, uh, how many violations there have been in, in terms of codes, and you can find out how many licenses are available. At the end of October, you were correct, Marianne, there's 168 licenses available, which puts our number at about 14%, and our cap is 20%, so we have lots of room to grow if we need to. Interestingly, as Marianne mentioned, uh, the, one of the things that people were concerned with when we started this operation was we're not doing enough to um, supervise the current rentals and, and um, if there's a violation, bring it to the owner's attention. Well, that's all changed. Uh, now during winter months, we're seeing as many as 500 violations a month, but in the summer months, over a thousand. And it's our after hours that are catching these because the violation doesn't occur at three o'clock on a Wednesday, it occurs Saturday night at 10 o'clock. So that's now being addressed. What we've focused on this first year, which is very important, only four people have been fined for any violation. What we're asking in this first year is if we see a violation, we're gonna photograph it, we're gonna tell the owner and the property manager and we need to see it corrected. If it's done, we're done, we're fine. The only people that have been ticketed and therefore fined are people who have repeatedly been told about a violation and have refused to do anything about it. So I think we've achieved the right balance between paying attention to violators and having what I think is a pretty reasonable cap on it at 20%. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Prickett. We have time for several more questions and I still haven't gotten to all that were submitted in advance by members of the community. So uh, I'm gonna stick with those for now. We're back around to Mr. Moffitt. Um, the next question is on town finances, or related to town finances, and it's the town's currently debating a change that if approved 
would provide a modest stipend for the mayor and members of council. Do you support the proposed annual stipends of $4,000 for council members and $8,000 for mayor and why? <laughs> well, I'm glad I go first. <laughs> so um, I, I actually had a discussion with Mayor Weaver about this and I told him that my personal opinion was that um, it was not necessary. Um, that certainly has you know, a $4,000 annual stipend is not going to ever be the reason that I'm going to run for town council. Um, he explained to me that he thought it was an indication of how serious these jobs were, and it was an indication that the town appreciated people with being willing to devote the time and attention to, to a position uh, on, the, on the council. And I understand that. Um, I think it's perfectly fine if, uh, if the stipend goes into, into play, um, I probably will donate mine because it's certainly not going to change my life. And it's, and I don't, I don't, I didn't do this to get paid. So. Thank you, Mr. Moffat. Well, I didn't get into it to get the money either. I was hoping to get used to the corporate debt bill <laughs> on a fractional basis. Um, no, seriously, uh, I think that the, I think it's a good idea. It's not a significant amount of money. And if you look what other coastal communities are doing, it's really not a significant amount of money relative to what they're doing, but it is a tangible token of appreciation for the time, energy, and effort that goes into serving the town. That being said, I don't intend to take mine. And I learned from my accountant that specified just don't even donate. I just, just let the town have it. That's my, my, my personal belief about this. But I think that the town should, do, should continue on and compensate. And I have for years thought that we need to be paying the mayor something a lot more than what he's getting paid now. Thank you. Ms. Collin? When this uh, topic came up, I, my first reaction was, I don't think we need to do this. However, after considering some of the research that's been done on the town and some of the risks that could possibly happen, I've changed my opinion of that. And I think that there is something to recognizing the value that the mayor and council provides for this community. This year, we happen to have one person, uh, two people, uh, competing, you know, challenging. There have been years when there have been no candidates. There have been very few candidates that if you wanted to be on the council, you just signed up and went to your candidate night and that was it. It's harder and harder to get people involved and have them make the commitment that's so important for this community. I really believe that um, while certainly people aren't going to do it for the money, and that's exactly what I said, that's not going to get, first of all, I don't want people that would do it for the money. I want people that really want to do this job because it takes your full commitment. Um, this is a way to recognize the value that they are contributing to the community. Thank you, Ms. Connelly. Mm -hmm. Mr. Prickett. Uh, thank you. Um, it's an interesting question, um, and one that I'm sure every town in uh, South Carolina has faced. Um, I think it's a good idea. I think we need to find the best qualified people we can and encourage them to take this step up and serve an elected, or in the case of the judge, an appointed position. I mentioned at the last town council meeting, John Stroud, who's retiring as our judge after eight years. Um, he had an outstanding legal career professionally and brought to his courtroom not only decades of experience, but a knowledge of the law that's just rare. And, um, and we were served well by him. And that's the kind of people I'd like to see in every either appointed or sort of elected position of our town. I've also watched carefully Mayor Weaver work over the last couple of years. It's a difficult job. He's the CEO of our community. He's also a legislator. He's kind of like the president and the head of the Congress. Um, and he spends at least 20 hours a week in the office. I think we owe these people some recognition. Nobody's gonna take this job for $4,000 a year or be the mayor for $8,000 a year. It's not enough to pay their club dues. 
Um, but I really think we want to acknowledge the importance of these roles. And as he once said to me, if, if I need to ask you to do something extra, something that's going to take another six weeks out of your life, I don't want to feel bad about asking you to do that as a council member. So if I'm paying you a little bit, you're going to, you're going to step up to the plate. We need people to step up to the plate. I think it's a good idea. Thank you, Mr. Prickett. Mr. Ross. Um, let me begin by saying that um, I put in my papers to run before I knew anything about this issue. However, as an economist, if elected, I'm going to keep the money. So, standing <laughs> but, uh, but, but what I really think is yes, this is a very good idea. I think when you're dealing with budgets of this size, problems of this size, that you want people to be professionals. This shows that what you're talking about are a group of professionals that are here to make a difference. And I think it's important. And I think, yes, it's a good idea. Thank you, Mr. Ross. Scott, I think you're first up for the next question. Oh, okay. Parker, bring it up. <laughs> um, sea level rise. It's happening. Is it a significant issue in your mind? And what do you see as the most important near-term concerns related to sea level rise? I don't think you can live on, on a coastal barrier island and not recognize that sea level rise is happening. Uh, I think that when you look at just sunny day flooding, it's, it's a real problem. And I think that Kika, which works, works behind the gate and the town which works in front of the gate, need to get together and I believe that they are getting their act together and working on flood mitigation and raising road services and doing all the necessary things to make that happen. I recently had an opportunity to uh, go to a webinar in which the town of Norfolk, Virginia, which is living in almost Venice-like conditions right now in terms of their, their flooding, so much so that their residents are actually having to put wicker baskets up on their porches so the FedEx guy can leave packages above where they know the tides are gonna come in at some point in the day. And, you know, Kiowa, we're starting to see that. We've got parts of the roads now that are absolutely unpassable on sunny days just because of the keen tides. And that's because the sea level is rising. It ain't because the Kika, our Kiowa is sinking, the sea is rising. Uh, and so it's a significant problem and one that we're gonna to have to work very hard on. Yes. Uh, sea level rise is indeed very important. Let's face it, it has economic, social, and environmental impact on all of us. Right now, there's a uh, group to get group that has been working on it. It's comprised of the various business entities on Kiowa, and they put in place this adaptive management process to develop goals and objectives, and then implement management decisions when appropriate. There'll be a continuous monitoring of different practices that will allow us to identify trigger points uh, at which further action has to be taken. One of the areas that we've talked about um, this past year was the repaving of the Kiowa Island Parkway from the front gate out to the circle. And my question was, is this the time that we should think about adding that three inches of it that's available, the three inches that's recommended in the sea level rise uh, report that would require elevating the road three inches. We decided uh, that was something that would wait because number one, the expense is extraordinary. Number two, it wasn't really at the point where we needed. However, if we do, we're not just saying wait forever to do something like this. We're hoping also that there'll be additional research and products available that will be much more cost effective than actually just putting the um, asphalt on top of what exists and then that means you have to raise everything else around it. So sea, sea level rise is really important. And there's a partnership right now as I mentioned with the groups working together from the business units to the park, Kika, and the town. Thank you, Ms. Connolly. Mr. Prickett. Thank you. Uh, 
I think all of us recognize that sea level rise is here. And in fact, uh, I'm delighted that the town and its partners, including Kika, have adopted the adaptive management plan or process. Um, and a number of people have been working on this, but there's lots of components to it. The key point is we're looking at all the ways that this community can protect both its property and its people as we face sea level rise and changes in tide patterns. Uh, and obviously, as we're seeing already this year, storm seasons, which may become more extreme and more frequent and longer. We're in November now, and we're already faced with more named storms coming up. That's very unusual. Um, two examples I want to mention, uh, the Kiowa Conservancy is doing work on the groundwater table, which as I mentioned earlier, is important to us. As they develop a database there around this, it's going to be helpful to us to understand what sea level rise is going to do to our groundwater, and how we can protect our groundwater table. They're also doing this marsh vulnerability study. One of the things we've got, we have several things that help us on this island. We're surrounded by these wonderful marshes and by studying them and their movement, where we need to protect the island over time, over decades, we'll be able to see where barriers can actually help us and where we've got erosion problems and where we've got accretion opportunities. So that's gonna help. Same is true with the beaches. We've got to continue to monitor the beaches and where we've got accretion, take care of it, where we need to supplant it, we need to work on that. So I'm pleased that the town is looking long-term along with all of its partners at sea level rise in a, system, a systemic way so we can measure these things and get it taken care of over time. And we're all in it together. So I, I think we're in actually pretty good shape if we follow our lead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Prickett. Mr. Ross. Um, I too am, am opposed to sea level rise, um, <laughs> just as a general statement. My concern, however, is okay, we're going to get solutions. How are we going to pay them? What are we going to do to finance the solutions to keep the island dry? That's what it comes down to. I don't think that. The town has sufficient funds. I don't think Kika has sufficient funds. I think this is going to be a very expensive proposition when we get down to it. And the question is, what are we going to do about it? And I think we've got to start thinking in terms of looking outside of current revenue sources and figuring out how to expand them for just this purpose. And that may include something like development fees for sea level. You could put a fee on the development of new properties and set it aside in a fund to pay for sea level rise. Or, so, or something, I mean, you know, other ways. I just think we have to start thinking about this because before we can have a solution, we've got to figure out how we're going to pay for that solution. And right this minute, I don't see the resources there to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ross. Mr. Moffitt. So I believe that the sea level rise issue is, is definitely a real problem. And if you if, if, if for any reason you doubt that, um, walk along the marsh side of West Beach um, at high tide and look at how far up under those houses the water comes now versus five years ago, it didn't come up there at all. Um, I had water in the edge of my yard and I'm not, I'm halfway between the ocean and the marsh. And we at high tide, we have water in our yard that we never had before. Um, so it's definitely a real issue. I think the, the, the complexity of it is that it impacts us in so many different ways, whether it's the beach, the marsh, the water table. Uh, and I think the work that's being done cooperatively between the town and Kika is really good in that we're looking at all of those different, different areas. And I think maybe to Mr. Ross's point, we need to find those areas that, that potentially are of the most immediate concern figure out how to address those problems. You can't, you can't fix all of it at once, but you need to have some kind of prioritization of those problems. Thank you, Mr. Moffat. And I'm sure this troubles you all greatly, but we're getting close to the end here. Um, <laughs> I do want to make sure that I ask this question that was submitted about uh, Johns Island Roads. And I believe Marianne, uh, uh, Ms. Connolly, I believe you're up first. Um, 
But the question is, have you considered the recent proposals regarding widening Bow Picket and do you have a position? Yes, I do. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I'm not sure if it was this year or last year, I went to some of the hearings that were had to provide public information to the public on the various uh, plans that were gonna be available for the roads. As many of you probably know, we've been working on this for 30 years and there's no solution yet. Most recently, we received information that they're looking at um, proposal number three. Proposal number three involves having the road come from Maybank and River Road over to Bohicket Road. If that was done, it would cut out a lot of the traffic that currently holds up uh, the line of cars on Maybank Highway going down to Main Road and then from Main Road down to Bohicket. I personally think this is one of the good, good alternatives it also minimizes the number of relocations that have to take place. I believe there's about seven or eight homes that would be impacted by this. Of course, it would be better if no one was impacted, but in order to try and fix the roads, this is something that has to be done. I think that our, our access to Kiowa is terrible. I think the road is in poor repair. There's just too many accidents. And you know the fact that we had two pedestrian killings, deaths in the past month and a half is really sad. We need lighting, we need an expansion of the road, the width, and just a better, safer road for all the people that use it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Connolly. Mr. Prickett. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, yeah, the uh, main road quarter, which is what we're talking about here, has been addressed by the county, and they've got uh, five alternatives out right now. The one I like best is alternative four. Um, it proposes, starting at the end of Betsy Harrison, a new road gets created that cuts across the island, basically, um, on its way to where eventually 526, I-526, is expected to be extended, and it would connect there and put us on what then is the new part of 526. The advantage to, to option four or alternative four is, is cost less, uh, up, it upends fewer families, a uh, smaller number of homes. Um, I would hate to see us redevelop what I call Bohecken Highway because its charm and beauty is what we see today. Same is true with River Road. I think River Road would be a very expensive process to do. Anyway, if we cut across the island and build a connection that, now we gotta be careful. If 526, I-526 never gets extended, we can't have this thing dump off in the middle of the field. So we're gonna have to connect it into the highway system as it is, but with the alternative of 526 becoming probable in the next decade, then we ought to be able to connect to it and go from there. It's the best alternative. And I think all of us need to get educated on what the options look at and be noisy when it comes to the county and tell them which ones we like. But I think number four looks good. Thank you, Mr. Prickett. Mr. Ross? Um, I mostly think something's got to be done. Um, I raised two teenage boys. I lost three nice cars in the process. Fortunately, they walked away from all of it. I look at I-26 as simply a death trap for, I mean, not I-26, main road is simply a death trap driving at night. I, I don't know which is the best alternative. I'm quite willing to go with what you're saying. Before. I don't care. I just want something done. Mostly since I've been here, what we've done is talked and talked and talked about this. We talked about 526, we talked about connections to 526, and we're continuing to talk. And the trouble is that doesn't get the road built. So I'm for doing whatever we can do to get it going, and get people off of Main Road and move some of those oak trees out of the way. That's what I think. Thank you, Mr. Ross. Mr. Moffat. Uh, my opinion is that with all of the alternatives that we have available to us that would not include widening Mohicket, cutting down all the trees and getting rid of that 
that great tunnel we have coming in would be better choices. The option four, um, it does appear to me to be a great option because it, uh, it accommodates the traffic flow uh, and limits the, uh, I guess, the changes to the, the beauty of driving down Bovica Road. Thank you, Mr. Moffat. And Mr. Park. Yeah, um, I also uh, agree that the roads need to, something needs to be done. I mean, that's, that's clearly obvious. I think that the option that Dan is talking about is the one that makes the most sense for the community at, at large. And I also believe that it's my understanding that when these, these properties were platted 30 years ago, they were platted on the concept that 526 would be extended and that the cross island connector would tap into it. And that's how we would be able to manage the traffic to and from this end of the island. I also think that the town cannot do it by themselves. Uh, if we try to drive this process by ourselves, we'll just be blown off again as, oh, it's just all those rich people out of here with Seabrook that want this. I think we have to work with somebody like the Johns Island Task Force to help drive that process so that it's seen as a more of a, all three of the barrier islands working together and coming up with a common solution. But for my money, the one that goes just across that farmland and has the fewest impacts is the one that makes the most sense. Thank you, Mr. Parker. And, um, Thank you to all of you for your answers to the questions. I thought I had timed this perfectly, but forgot about your closing statement. So um, we'll start at this end, um, since we started down here at the beginning, and just ask that you make any final uh, comments and closing statements. Um, I would like to be elected. I would like to serve. Uh, let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. I've enjoyed this. It's been great fun. And I hope that we can do this again. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ross. Mr. Prickett. I learned you can't take your glasses off, or you have to take your glasses off before you can remove your <laughs> mask. Uh, yeah, very quickly, I'm excited about the next decade for this community. Uh, Nancy and I are delighted to be here. We enjoy this community. I think we've got lots going for us. I compare us very favorably with many coastal communities, and I think we've got a great future. I'd love to do another two years on the town council. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Prickett. Ms. Connolly. As I mentioned before, my first term as a town council member has been marked with thoughtful consideration and execution of policies in the interest of our property owners. Along with the mayor and my fellow council members, we've made a positive impact on the future direction of the town. There's still a lot more to do. And I really want to contribute, continue my tenure to provide continuity and also to make sure as far as two areas of particular interest for me, public safety, make sure that we have the best uh, safety provisions in place and also we're adding a bicycle patrol for the high season, which I'm looking forward to. And that uh, the wildlife programs are well uh, taken care of and they have what they need to be successful, including something like the dolphin strand feeding program. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Connolly. Mr. Parker. Um, I wanna serve, I wanna help. I want to do what I can for the town and the community that I live in. Uh, my name is Scott Parker. Please vote for me, and I approve this message. <laughs> I apologize. I should have been referring to you as Dr. Parker all night. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just so long as you don't call me Doc. That's the one thing that I can't stand. That's, that's either a really small dwarf or a vet. <laughs> or an alcoholic dentist in the West. <laughs> Did he just take up all my time? <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate y'all's support, and... Um, uh, I wouldn't have uh, submitted the paperwork if I didn't really want to serve on the council. I'm looking forward to the next four years. Thank you. Well, thank you to all the candidates for your participation tonight. And uh, for those that are uh, watching this online, I don't want you to go anywhere um, because we are going to have the mayoral candidates up next. But do just want to remind everyone that the election is scheduled for Tuesday, December 1st. And in-person voting will be held at the Sandcastle from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. The Charleston County Board of Elections administers the election on behalf of the town and their regular rules about absentee voting apply. Please visit the Town of Kiowa website at kiowaisland.org for more information 
They've established a dedicated page on their website that includes information on voting, a copy of the sample budget and more. So once again, thank you to the council candidates. Um, I hate to kick you out, but that's kind of what we're doing in light of COVID and we'll bring the uh, mayoral candidates in. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Jimmy. Those of you tuned in online, just sit tight. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Go all the way upstairs. Oh, it's upstairs. Good job, Thank you. Likewise. I'll throw those away. Oh, no. Not yet. Yeah. Oh, Give me a clean surface. Get those cotton out of there. You can't get any of that on this one. Thanks, good. Yeah. These are uh, clean waters. Those are clean waters and the new name tax. Tom, we have you here. We also have you here. Hi, how are you doing that? Change the place around. <laughs> Amazing what a fresh coat of paint <laughs> your carpet will be. You have clean services, clean waters. Yeah, we'll yourself Are we ready? Just real quick, I just want to tell John the microphone is there on the zoom with the green room. The camera is above the TV. It will train on when you're speaking. Yeah. But if you just look at the TV, right? yeah. and I think that she heard all of that earlier. Yeah. Emily's taking the slide down. All right. Well, welcome back uh, to everyone who is uh, participating or, or listening in online. We want to welcome you back to the 2020 Meet the Town Candidates Forum. We very much appreciate the council candidates for their uh, participation earlier. And now we're moving on to the mayoral race uh, between John Labriola and Klaus said. Um, the rules of the um, discussion are just the same as for the uh, council, and we'll ask that each of them make an opening statement, and then we'll have follow-up questions. We do ask for uh, COVID protocol that they uh, keep their mask on when not uh, speaking. So um, first up for an opening statement, uh, Mr. Labriola. Jimmy, thank you for moderating. Thank you to the Community Association for hosting. And thank all of you who are watching the discussion. It is important that you hear from all of the candidates before casting your vote for the person you believe to lead the town in these next four years. 
I've had many years of experience in management and leadership from both my professional career as a hospital administrator and as a member of council. I am ready and excited to face the challenges in the future as your as mayor. I served as CEO of a very large hospital just outside of Detroit. My staff and I were confronted with many complex challenges. We had to make difficult decisions, but we always had a commitment to keeping the patient as our primary focus. We found that working together was the key to make certain that, that happened. After 40 years in a healthcare professional, I clearly understand the importance of leadership, collaborative decision-making and commitment to people. Since retiring at Kiowa, I spent four years, I have the privilege of spending four years as a member of town council. At one of our very first meetings, we discussed how we could ensure and put into place actions that would benefit the entire community. As mayor pro town, I had the opportunity for a leadership role in working with the council, the community, to accomplish these objectives. It was important that the community were engaged and understood the background behind these issues. There were many discussions in this room, quite frankly, in public meetings on the issues to provide information and explanation on our progress. And I will share some of it with you in a minute. I believe then and now it is important that work be done as collaboratively as possible with robust communication. That is how I manage. In 2021, there will also be challenges. The virus will be a threat. We must be vigilant in making certain the actions we take place as the town governance are the right decisions for the entire community. And one of the first decisions that would be necessary to make will be uh, the expiration of the existing town ordinance on the summer <laughs> trip. The demands for our island continue for many reasons. Our challenge encompasses those that live here, full work part time, vacationers, there is a possible safe haven for visitors who just wish to get away. We saw a large increase in 2020 as the volume of visitors coming to Kayla to enjoy our beautiful island as this pandemic took hold. As the town leadership, we must be prepared to respond to this demand, protect the community, and especially our precious environment. I believe the financial security of Kayla is critical to its success. For example, many of us have experienced the impact of hurricanes, and I know the costly damage that can occur. This cost is felt in many ways, not only during the cleanup, but also in the restoration of the beaches. We must always be prepared to respond. Challenges must be approached with transparent and thoughtful discussions and include all members of the community. Making and execution of decisions is the primary function of leadership. We must always remember the role that we as a municipal government play in making Kiowa a safe and desirable place for families to live, vacation, and work. Artie and I have lived here for 10 years. It's been a blessing for us and our family. I can never overstate my commitment to this community. My goal will always to make certain that the health and well-being of the Kiowa community is the council's primary priority. That is my promise to you, to you, the staff, the town council, and all the stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Labriola. Mr. Sad. Good evening. My name is Klaus Sad. I'm running for mayor. I want to thank everyone for taking the time um, to tune in here, albeit virtually, and I really want to thank Jimmy and the Kika staff for setting it all up. Um, when it became known that I was going to run for mayor, um, friends, acquaintances, and people I really didn't know too well uh, asked me a lot of questions. And two of them were recurring. One was, um, why do you want to take on this responsibility? Why do you want to commit the time? Why do you want to deal with the inevitable criticism when you guys decide something that not everyone likes? and not everyone agrees with. Why do you want to deal with that? And the second question uh, was invariably, can you fix the speed limit on governor's drive? <laughs> um, thankfully, I can duck that one. We leave that one to Kika and to Jimmy, so I don't have to worry about it. Um, I'll focus why I am running from there. Uh, Kiowa is, as I'm sure we'll all agree, a very, very special place. I would say um, it, it was made that special place by the very, very hard work and a lot of foresight of a lot of people over the years. It will only stay that special place though with its unique brand, its great quality of life, protected natural habitat, strong property values and solid finances. If there are others who put in the hard work in the future who help ensure that. And I think the mayor's position is particularly critical here. To do it right, I believe a candidate needs to have commitment, energy, focus. But I believe a candidate needs to have the ability to build relationships and an ability to act decisively when needed, but compromise when warranted. 
I believe a candidate needs the ability to deal with criticism constructively. You're going to get plenty of it. Above all, I believe a candidate needs the willingness to listen and learn, always. Um, if elected, I'm committed to do my very best to bring those qualities to the mayor's job. I gave my decision to run a lot of thought and careful consideration. I would not be here in front of you this evening if I didn't feel a strong desire to serve you and to help improve our wonderful island and our special community. This is why I'm running for mayor and I respectfully ask for your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Said. As I mentioned earlier, we received questions submitted by members of the community and those included uh, questions on topics, including uh, development issues, COVID-19, town finances, short-term rentals, sea level rise, and Johns Island roads. And we'll, we'll try to touch on all of those and get to all of these questions. We didn't get to all of them in the, um, in the council session. Uh, but I'm gonna start with COVID-19. Um, and the question is, while there have been encouraging reports in the last week about the possibility of a vaccine, it appears that if it's approved, it won't be widely available until next spring. Over the past couple of months, the governor has largely turned the responsibility for emergency measures over to municipalities. And a few days after the new mayor and the council take office, the town's current emergency orders regarding face coverings, indoor dining, Harris Teeter occupancy, and other measures will expire. What actions, if any, are you likely to recommend or support at that time? Start with Mr. Said. I think the uh, emergency uh, ordinance actually expires on the date that the new council and mayor are sworn in. Um, I think it is important to remind ourselves that we will make decisions at the time based on the information we then have. This is three weeks from now, so we don't know. Um, Having said that, I think it's going to be very, very unlikely that we suddenly have a miraculous disappearance of the virus. Um, if anything, uh, South Carolina right now looks a little better than other parts of the country, that may well change. Um, I think um, we will need to, as a minimum, extend this emergency ordinance for another 61 days. I think also that we will need to look at, at the time, based on the information we have in more detail as to what this ordinance says, um, it may be, it may be that we decide that certain parts of it need tightening up. I cannot personally foresee um, a situation where we, where we would loosen anything. And a follow-up on that, um, if we were to see an increase in cases or deaths in the Charleston area, would you consider reimposing some of the more stringent measures that were in place earlier in the year? Um, yes, it's a simple answer. Thank you, Mr. Labriola. The role of governance, the role of this town council is the health and well-being of the community. Um, this virus isn't going away, not in the near term. And um, I think we can all pray that there'll be vaccine and hopefully in time with that applied to the community at large, things will get better. But I, I think these next two months are pivotal with two holidays, what we're seeing in terms of the influx of people coming down here for the big families. So I think we're gonna to have to be extremely vigilant about what takes place over this next period of time. We do have a moderate incident that, that's true in terms of the South Carolina area. But it can change. It's changing all over the country. So I just cannot imagine doing anything less than continuing what we're currently doing right now on the 75th. In terms of making it more stringent, I, I think that would have to be carefully considered. I, I, I just left the news today and uh, municipalities all over this country are making things more stringent. So I don't think we're immune from any of that. So I think we just have to be very careful. This is, this is truly a, a major issue for this entire country. Thank you, Mr. Labriola. I'll stick with you for the um, next one. Um, on development, do you feel that Kiowa is becoming overdeveloped? And if so, what might the town do to address this? The development 
on key <coughs> is prescribed in the development agreements that we've had for many, many, many years. Um, to the credit of both parties, the developer and the, com and, and, and the council, we we were always able to negotiate decompressing a lot of the sites that they had. Um, specific case in point is Ocean Park. There was, a, there, there could have been in the, in the initial development agreement more homes on Ocean Park. They agreed to decompress that and provide a lot of beautiful green area. So it's prescribed in terms of the development. It's going to happen. Um, I think that it's happening right now because there's a lot of homes being developed at the very tail end of, of the project. But I don't think it's a matter of whether there's more or less. This point, you know, it's going to be built out the way it was part of the plan. I think the plan has been um, remarkable. It's been followed very consistently throughout, and um, it just adds to the beauty of this you know, community. So I, I think it's just part of what's taking place in terms of the final conclusions to the development agreements that we've been negotiated over these many years. Hey, Mr. Labriola. Mr. Said? Yeah. I agree with John. Um, it, it's a popular question. It is to a degree a red herring because um, this is laid down in legally binding agreements. And if we were to decide now that the islands overdeveloped, there really isn't a lot we can or should be doing about it. I think the issue is not, um, I'll also point out that we are getting to the end of the development stage. There are probably somewhere between three and 400 lots left to be developed, which given the size of Kiowa is really not that big. So the island will largely be what it is now. I think the relevant issue is not, is the island overdeveloped? The relevant issue is how do we deal with the increasing density and the increasing population? How do we deal with our roadworks? How do we deal with um, our ponds and our water management? Uh, how do we deal with, um, how do we deal with um, the, um, changing mix of owners, part-time and full-time, investors, and renters. Um, how, does, how does the town over time change as the role of the, of the developers changes? So those are all challenges, I think, and they're uh, probably one of the major set of challenges on the, on the plate for a mayor and a council for the next four years. But they all come together as dealing with the effects of a change that is indeed prescribed. Thank you, Mr. Said. Sticking with you, um, a question on one of the ways the town um, spends money. Uh, historically, the town has allocated funds for charitable giving, usually in the range of $200,000 or so annually. Do you support continuation of this practice and why? I do. Um, the question has been raised whether this is the role of a municipal entity that is funded either by tax dollars or in the case of Kiowa by, by service fees, or whether that whether charity does not really begin at home and should be the role of private individuals. Um, I think if I look at the charitable contributions that the town makes, first of all, they're limited in, in size. And by limited, I mean relative to our budget. Um, and they directly benefit um, low country uh, charities um, where a relatively small amount of dollars makes a huge impact. Um, I think just simply in terms of looking at the amount of money involved as a share of our budget compared to the impact, I'm in favor of continuing that. I think it does need to be limited in size, which has been $150,000 to $200,000 or so every year. Thank you, Mr. Seth. Mr. Labriola, charitable giving? Oh, my yes. I support that. I had the opportunity to serve on the Lady University Board for uh, five years. Um, our contributions to Our Lady of Mercy, our contributions to all of that listing of, of charitable uh, groups, is enormous to them. They do marvelous things with the money that we and others give to them. So I um, most definitely would support it. We'd hopefully we would always continue to be able to support it. Um, and I think that the, the question, if, if, if we can always do more to explain where those monies go and who those groups are that are receiving the money. 
and I think that we um, take extreme pride in knowing of what we're doing and what we're helping. And, and to, quite frankly, I think the community association has really stepped up with a lot of their programs too in terms of what they provide. So we're very fortunate here. We have a community that surrounds us that is nowhere near as fortunate. I'm gonna slip in a question that was submitted during the council discussion. Um, and, and let me just acknowledge that I'm accepting that the, 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 the residents information here is correct. I, I, I don't know, but it says that the financials of the town uh, show un, undesignated funds of close to $10 million. And is that an appropriate um, size of funds uh, to be holding and, and this resident says, with no clear objective or need for future usage. The overall balance is probably close to $30 million, both in terms of restricted and unrestricted funds. Um, that portion, I think that is about the amount, I think give or take $10, $11 million. One of the questions that any non-for-profit has or any municipal center has is, is that enough? And over the years, we've tested that, whether that was enough. Seems like a great deal of money. It is a great deal of money until we have a hurricane and until we have to have beach restoration, until we have to have, um, in, and in some cases, a, a real disaster, the bridge going out or something like that. So is it enough? We felt a number of years ago that it needed to be more. And that was one of the driving I say that some of the objectives that we set out again a number of years ago was to improve and increase the financial security of the town. And that was really one of the driving components with the annexation of fresh fields. You get additional revenue streams coming in. So um, it, it, we're, on a, we're on a trajectory that we will continue to be more and more, have, have greater resources, hopefully as the years come. I think that will always be needed. So, um, I don't think it's too too little. Right? Hopefully, we just be able to keep them all. Thank you, Mr. Labriel. Mr. Said, Go ahead, I, mean, uh, um, I think the number is twenty million um, in cash. Um, it's about eleven million uh, in unrestricted funds, and it's about nine million in restricted funds, where you know the funding goes back to state accommodations taxes, which we can't simply uh, use. Um, I've been asked that question before, and um, the person um, made the analogy to a corporation that is sitting on large amounts of cash, shouldn't that be returned to the shareholder? And I said, probably if the corporation doesn't make the appropriate return, the thing is, this is a municipality, not a corporation. Um, our goal is not maximization of shareholder value. And our goal, uh, and we do not have funding sources. So there's two problems with arguing that this is too much. Uh, and then that it is, I think the questioner uh, said, uh, has no clear purpose. First of all, I think the cash surplus of the town has a very clear purpose. Um, we've war gamed, I believe, a really bad hurricane. And for all those who think, nah, maybe not really going to happen, I would remind them of Matthew. I wasn't here, but I was watching the news very, very nervously because that was a Cat 4 not too long before it hit, and it could have come at high tide. And that would have been very bad. Um, uh, Cat five hurricane that hits us could cost the town anywhere from ten to twenty million dollars, and that is a number um, that's actually been war gamed out. That's not something that's made up. And that was your surplus. Um, the other point that people have to remember is the town does not have revenue sources that are independent from the economy. We do not have tech. We do not raise a property tax. If you raise a property tax, economy goes up, economy goes down, so you still get your property tax. The town does not have the ability to raise <clears throat> assessments. The town raises its money from fundamentally from service fees, um, building permits, business licenses, trash, and such like. If we start reducing our cash surpluses and something happens, there's no easy way for the town to raise the money again. So I don't know how much is too much, but I think it is very important to remain prudent. And given that we're in a coastal community where hurricanes do happen, um, continue to build that surplus if at all possible. Thank you, Mr. Said. I want to talk about short-term rentals uh, with you. Uh, the town has tightened restrictions on short-term rentals on Keel Island 
to include setting limits and stricter enforcements. Do you believe the town has achieved the right balance or are there areas you believe need to be changed or improved? Well, since I was on council and heavily involved in it, it would be somewhat disingenuous to say, I think this was all wrong. Um, let's talk about two things separately. One is um, uh, the rental, the, the, the structure of the short-term rental ordinance and what is enforcement. Um, the whole idea behind what the council did under the mayor's leadership in structuring the, um, the new short-term rental ordinance was to create balance. Uh, to create balance between renters and owners, to create rental, to create balance between residents or, and those who have bought for investment. Um, we did not want to choke off economic activity. We're fully cognizant of the fact that renters are very important to the economy of the island, to the resort, to fresh fields, to everyone. But at the same time, if you think about an island where every other home is a rental, I think a lot of people would say, well, I don't want to be there. Well, maybe every third home, maybe not. Um, in the end, we came up with the, with the solution, and it's not a scientific number, that it should be 20% of the R1 and R2 properties. And should always remember that large parts of the island are completely unrestricted when it comes to renting. So my view is that we, um, walk a fine line, we chose a good middle ground. Um, I continue to maintain that I don't think we will ever, or certainly not in the next, in the term of the next mayor hit the cap, We've got 168 left. Uh, we had 200 when we first put this in. So it's growing pretty slowly. Um, I think this was done the right way. Um, on enforcement, a lot of the complaints about the short-term rental ordinance actually turned out to be complaints about lack of enforcement and those were justified. That's why so much we have invested money to create after hours enforcement and we will continue doing, doing more of it. Um, we've had, I don't know, 2000 plus citations uh, for a variety of infringements. Um, and as was said previously, very few of those led to fines. We just want the rules to be respected. I think we could probably do more, but it's a very good start, I think. I did get one follow-up question or one additional question on short-term rentals that I wasn't able to ask in the council session. Um, and you said you don't think you'll hit the cap, but what would you do if you reached the short-term rental cap during your term? Well, I think anyone who's ever run for office in anything will say, well, that's a hypothetical question. I'm definitely not answering that one because you can only get into trouble if you answer hypothetical questions. Um, my personal, this is my personal view, um, standing here today with the information I have today that may well be different five years from now, but standing as I'm here today, I would say the cap is in place. And if someone wants a short-term rental license, he or she gets on the wait list for those licenses that become available. Because as you know, we structured it such that a license does not automatically stay with the house but goes back in, into a pool. So um, I think this is a well-chosen target and standing as I am here, I would not want to call it a moving target. Thank you, Mr. Said. Uh, Mr. Labriola, um, again, the, the question was um, the town did tight restrictions on short-term rentals, including limits and stricter enforcement, do you think it's the right balance? I have very little to add. I did have an opportunity to talk with Stephanie and to Mayor Weaver. I think it was a good, they challenged a very difficult issue. And I, you know, I really applaud the effort that was made and I think keep that balance. So I, I don't have much, much more to add. It was just something that really needed to be done. And typically when there's things that really needed to be done, they do create a sense of controversy over, that's why they haven't been done before. I think this was a prime example that things needed to be out, they needed to be discussed, they needed to be disclosed, information needed to be shared. But I think the end result is a, is a good point. And I think as was said, cap's a cap. And I, I think we're quite a ways away from it, but the cap's a cap, I think it's safe. Okay, um, I'll shift uh, to sea level rise. Um, Mr. Labriola, is sea level rise a significant issue in your mind? Um, and what do you believe are the most near term uh, concerns related to sea level rise? Oh, I think it's a very serious concern. And, you know, again, I think that the, 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 
mayor and council addressed a very serious issue. And um, I read the report, some remarkable experts. We, it just shows the type of credentials of the caliber of people that we have on the island in terms of the preparation of the report. Um, I think, getting back to governance, the, the, the key behind reports like that for, for, for the town, the mayor, and the council is to keep the momentum going relative to this study. It is sometimes too easy for studies to be completed. There's a certain amount of motivation, there's a certain amount of enthusiasm, and then things begin to, it goes on the shelf somewhere. I think this study is so worthwhile, it needs to be, needs to be continued to, uh, to move forward. You know, I would like to see this put into, into place tangible objectives, tangible timelines in terms of what can be done, when it can be done. Once again, this is a problem that's not going to go away. And uh, I think as, there, as I recall the report, there were a number of steps that were needed to be undertaken, both in terms of the town and community association. So I think we just need to keep working on all of us. Thank you, Mr. Flavriel. Mr. Said, sea level rise. Yeah, I mean, pretty hard to uh, find daylight between the two of us on that position, I think. Uh, um, the, the thing with sea level rise, though, is um, we all agree it, it's going to happen. Um, we all agree it is a problem for a coastal community. What's a little bit more complicated is when it's going to happen. It's not happening tomorrow morning. I think we all agree on that, too. Um, and that's not supposed to be a flippant remark, but it relates directly to the cost of dealing with all the issues that have to be dealt with, which is why I think the um, adaptive management plan that we are, we're pursuing here is so important, where, first of all, we have chosen a scenario that may be too aggressive, it may be too conservative, it is a middle of the road scenario, but it's definitely a the sea level is rising scenario. But the first and most important step is, is to define the trigger points that require action, right? So um, in the report, there's an example where, you know, if every time it rains, road ABC is underwater by a foot and a half, we got an issue. If after the most monumental rainstorm ever, it's underwater by a foot and a half, and it's never been underwater before, maybe we can defer that a little bit. And I think that is the first and most uh, important and critical process that's underway now to define those trigger points. And that's what the survey um, that was just con concluded was about. Um, but I completely agree with John. This is one of those things that can get forgotten. Yeah, we've, we've got the report and other things are more pressing now. This has to be actioned in one form or another always because it's a long process. The, real effects of this are likely not going to be felt here for 20 or 30 years, long before, well, we might still be on council, who knows, but um, <laughs> um, but it's important. It's very important. I want to talk, ask you about John's Island Roads um, and um, whether or not you've considered the recent proposals regarding the widening of the Bohicator River Roads. Do you have a position on this? Yeah, I mean, my primary position is frustration that this should have gone on for near on 30 years with very, 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 um, I guess we finally got Bay Bank and River Road, which for all those, and I'm sure that's everyone here who stood in that traffic jam is actually a major improvement. Um, I'm not holding my breath on when the next steps really get implemented. Um, conceptually, um, I like the, um, the Cross Island Parkway. It would be it would be especially used because it, it cuts through parts of of the island where there's very little um, where there are very few people to displace it's primarily farmland it would be especially useful uh, if it could connect to an extended mark clark um i'm not super bullish on that ever being extended um i think widening bohicket is a solution that doesn't really talk to me. I think a lot of people and homes get displaced, beautiful trees get displaced, but more importantly, it's really unclear to me, having read this report and the study, um, that we actually solve our major traffic problems. I think uh, John's Island is going to run into infrastructure and road problems that need a bigger solution. And that is in the ideal world, it would be the Mark Clark and 
and uh, the cross island connector but i think we can do with the cross island parkway even without the um without 526 being extended um i'm just as i said uh, the town is heavily involved and we will do whatever we can to advocate um i'm not sure how bullish i am that something happens in a reasonable time frame Thank you, Mr. Sepp. Mr. Labriola, John Island Roads, widening Pohicket River and the other alternatives. Well, you remember the discussions well. Um, it is good that they're reappeared, and it's, um, it's kind of ironic that they're reappearing, and I think it just demonstrates the continued demand and pressure that's being placed. Once upon a time, the Cross Island Parkway was a very viable plan. We had talked in terms of it being possibly even a toll road. Uh, we had done uh, comparisons in terms of other areas where there are similar uh, roads like that. Um, there was a, a sense of funding, the half half cent, half penny was a, was a source of funding with the 526 extension. Um, we had, we had uh, contacted engineers, there were blueprints, there was how it was going to traverse the way, navigate its way through John's Island. And it stopped. So that was a while ago. Again, it's good to see that it's coming back up. I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, um, I'm a little bit skeptical about all of it. There is a solution. There is a plan. Both of them cost a lot of money. Both the, going through the John's Island in 526. Um, will it need to be done? It, there's this, there's a mindset that by continuing to limit the amount of development of roads, you limit the amount of development. I think, you know, the many, we, we had talked about would John's Island ever be developed? Well, as the years have gone by, we've just seen more and more and more development. Here again, this problem is not going to go away. Those communities are getting built and filled, and we're in the other end of, of all of that. So the, the pressure is going to continue. So I think we need to do everything we can. God bless Paul, you know, Paul Roberts, who continues to spend his time and energy to, to help guide that. We have, you know, former Merrill Puma and John Taylor that sit on those committees. So we have excellent representation. It's a, it's a tough sell. Mr. Labriola, um, uh, I, I received a question that, um, an individual question for each of you, um, but based on the same premise that or the same introduction. It says um, the town is a form of governance that is based on a strong mayor system, which requires the mayor to possess strong financial uh, management, understanding and skills, as well as communication and leadership skills. Uh, and the first question is for Mr. Labriola um, related to that, and then I'll have one for Mr. Set. It says, uh, Mr. Labriola, during the um, four years you remember the town council um, some memorable, memorable events uh, occurred, some good, like the sale of the old town hall and building a new one, and some bad, um, the, uh, uh, the defalcation of town assets by trusted employees, uh, which happened to the lack of control policies and proper oversight. Um, essentially, the question is, these, these um, events took place during your term. And what lessons did you glean from that experience and what practices need to be in place um, so that uh, voters will have the confidence that the experience will not reoccur? Who's going to ring the bell at the end of two minutes? <laughs> um, what the question is referring to that the uh, town manager and the treasurer um, were stealing from the town um, they had a form of collusion that had been going on for a number of years. Not only the time that I was there, but that preceding the time I was there, even past councils and past mayors. Um, yes, they were trusted employees. And um, myself, as a volunteer, as a member of council, um, we all tried to help. They had needs, they had deficiencies, they had performance problems. And I think I could speak to every member of council and every and the mayor. We tried to help them improve their performance, improve, improve their situation. Never, ever realizing that they were stealing from us. 
what we did do is that we discontinued or we terminated the town manager's contract. Upon the termination of her contract, an employee came forward, a whistleblower, and told us that, or what, was, what, what she thought was being, what was taking place. The following day, we shut down their computers and we brought in, we, we had a, we assigned a forensic auditor to get started. That was the beginning of the investigation. That was the beginning of the, disclosing to the community what was taking place. That was the beginning of a long legal battle. And um, what did we learn from it? A lot. A lot. I don't know. In my career, I experienced white collar crime. In my career, I experienced collusion. In my experience, I experienced um, uh, drug use. I mean, things happen. And it's something that is a, it was, it was tragic for all of us. It was tragic for the staff. Um, it was a blow to the community. It was a blow to us in terms of having trusted employees to find out what they were doing. Uh, never, it, we never, it was difficult even to believe. And we went through this exhausting study with these forensic auditors to find out that there it was. And that had been going on for many, many, many years. So what did we learn? We, we changed our auditing firm. We, the audit committee is far more um, involved relative to the auditing firm in terms of establishing criteria. We had done that before, but not as, not as explicit as it is now. And that's, that was really the way they were getting around it um, in terms of um, salaries that were being extended. So we learned, we learned. And um, again, I was on the board of Our Lady of Mercy. And this thing had ramifications all through the nonprofit community that somebody, the two people, could be doing such something like this. And I think every board and every nonprofit was looking at their policies and procedures, and that's how we all learn. And um, so yeah, learned a lot. We learned a lot. I mean, there's, there's the town, you know, the town finances in terms of the control systems better. Of course they're better. And what's better, we were able to recruit and hire Stephanie, we were able to recruit and hire Ruta. So it's a far better, far improved situation than it was, you know, years back. Thank you, Mr. Labriola. Um, again, um, the town's form of governance is based on the strong mayor system, which requires the mayor to possess strong financial management, understanding and skills, as well as communication and leadership. Uh, Mr. Said, you've been a member of town council for the last two years and served on the audit committee and the ways and means committee. Um, what additional procedures or practices do you believe need to be put in place to assure town assets will be protected and the town government will operate in a completely transparent manner? Well, I think that if I really had an answer to that in terms of procedure A, B, and C, then I would not have done my job on town council the last two years, and neither would the mayor uh, or, the, or the other council members, because that should have long been brought up. So um, I think I would have to say that um, I think we are the town and its governance are well situated. Um, we are, um, it is very well controlled. And I, standing here, cannot, nor do I want to, um, come up with something that we are not doing that needs to be done because we would have done it already. Okay, I'll, I'll uh, close out my questions with uh, one last one on town. Um, Am I saying? Yes, please. Sorry. And um, this is a, an issue that the town's debating right now. And if, it, if approved, it would provide a 
modest stipend for the mayor and members of council. Do you support the proposed annual stipends of $4,000 for council members and $8,000 for mayor and why? I do. Um, I think it is in line with just about every um, community in, similar to ours in South Carolina. Um, it is a, well, as others have said, here's what it's not. It is not a reason to run for council. It's not a reason to run for mayor. Um, it is, I believe, an expression of um, expression by the town that the work that is being put in by councilman and the mayor, which is a lot, it's a lot of hours and it's a lot of focus, is worthwhile and um, is valued. I think um, I think also that for future council members and future mayoral candidates, um, that goes. I think it is, you know, as the mayor said, it is a, a token of appreciation. And at the same time, it puts you with skin in the game. So when the mayor comes and says, I need this little bit of extra here too, he feels more comfortable doing it. Um, I think it's probably something that's overdue. I know it's been, talked about or thought about for quite a while. Um, and I think it is an important token. And that's really what it is. So I'm, I'm fair, yes. Thank you, Mr. Said. Mr. Labriola. Um, and at the November uh, town council meeting, um, Mayor Weaver went over a report that Dan Prickard had put together. And there was like nine threats, nine major concerns that the town could face. And one of them was, continued um, recruitment that can, you know, generating energy in terms of members of the community to run for town council there. And I think it's wonderful that we have seven individuals doing that right now. And I, <coughs> the town and also the association, we have a wealth of knowledge and experience and good talent in this community and we have to get them to want to run for these positions. And I think two, um, this council tackled two issues. One was the, uh, the timing with the two terms or the two years and four years. I think that was a very positive addition in this compensation. And I think as was said, it, the compensation is a matter, is, is a form of recognition, is a form of, of uh, appreciation, a, a form of value for the time, the time served. And uh, I had had a chance to talk with uh, about that, and I, I clearly agree. I think it was it was well done and well supported, and uh, and hopefully we'll continue to to generate um, it along with with other things that we do. Continue to generate community members' interest in serving on committees, committees being volunteers, serving on committees, being committee chairs, running for boards of Kika, running for town council. I mean, that's that's the these two associations, the town and the association are hugely important. They're community driven and they need to have community representation. So I think anything we can do to make that all happen is, uh, is good, it's good. Well, thank you. That, that is all the questions that were submitted. And um, Holly tells me we've not gotten any additional questions online. Um, and I think I've managed the timing a little bit better than I did in the last session. So, um, I don't remember who went first on opening statement. All right, closing, uh, as you said. Okay. Um, I wanna make a few observations. Um, four years, but I don't need my glasses for that. Sorry. Four years as mayor or council member does not bring you fame, fortune, or power. It's a significant investment of time and energy and I think uh, my first observation is that it should make us really proud to see that we have seven candidates for five elected positions. And I think that says something about our community. Secondly, um, this election is about electing community members who want to serve. It's not about electing politicians. With that in mind, uh, let me say something that you probably won't hear in a political debate. Um, I don't think 
the voter on Kiowa can make a bad decision in December, whoever they vote for. Um, I think we have seven really good, capable, and committed residents running. And that is, if I've ever seen a first class problem to have, that's a first class problem to have. Lastly, uh, not surprisingly, there is very little, if any, daylight at all between mayoral platforms here. Um, we're both in favor of protecting our environment, building relationships across stakeholders, managing our finances conservatively, and protecting the character and the brand of the island. And that is not surprising. So I think um, I, I will say, though, um, there's, I do speak much better German than my competitor than my opponent. So <laughs> if that becomes in any way relevant, I think you should bear that in mind. Um, but I think for the voter, the decision will ultimately come down to personal choice. Um, if your choice is to elect me as mayor, I certainly pledge to bring to the job um, the enthusiasm, the energy, and indeed the stamina. It's going to be a tough job that is needed to do it well for a long term of four years. Election is December 1 at the Sandcastle. Come out to vote. Thank you all for your time. Thank you, Mr. Said. Mr. Labriola. Well, thank you for doing this. Um, why am I here? I, I, I have the privilege of serving as councilman, mayor for a town. Um, it's a huge commitment. It's a wonderful, as I reflect upon it these last four years, um, a lot of opportunities, a lot of good experiences, far more good than, than, than bad. Um, when I realized that Mayor Weaver was not going to run, I reflected on this most of the summer, thought I could help. And um, these are truly jobs that are a privilege. They really are. And um, thank you. Be safe. <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Labriola, uh, and Mr. Said. And, and I'm, I'm just gonna repeat what I said um, in my introduction, and that is, um, we wanna thank all the candidates for offering themselves for public service. Um, both of you gentlemen have, have already served time on the, on the town council. And we know that most people come to Kiowa to enjoy a, a well-earned uh, retirement. And so stepping up to serve the community is something that um, we thank you very much for doing. I also wanna um, repeat that um, the election is scheduled for Tuesday, December 1st, and in-person voting will be held at the Sandcastle from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. The Charleston County Board of Elections administers the election on behalf of the town and their regular rules about absentee voting apply. Please visit the Town of Keough Island website at keoughisland.org for more information where they've established a special or a dedicated page that includes information on voting, a copy of the sample budget and more. And uh, finally, thanks to all the voters uh, who tuned in tonight in this um, unusual format. Um, we hope that you could hear us uh, clearly and we hope that this was the next best thing to being together in person. So we wish you all a very nice evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, no, so. <clears throat> very nice to meet you.